I had a pastor one time say, well, Dan, uh, you keep preaching on this healing. I actually have had probably 10, 10 pastors say this, but I had one really emphatic, and he just, he looked at me when I answered him, and he just, he didn't understand. And I'm not belittling him. I'm saying, we're not seeing very deep sometimes or profound in the sense of what's there. He said, why pursue all this healing? Because you've got to die of something. And I'm like, what is that? What causes us to be like that? I'm like, help us, God. And I'm not demeaning people. I'm saying there's something that allows us to think so natural, so human. Where does it say that you have to die from sickness? Where does it say that if you die, it's because your body had to fail, or you had to have a heart attack or lung disease, or why can't you run your course and go to sleep like the Bible says, and they, go, they went to sleep? Why can't you just go to bed at night and not wake up, but be in Him? Amen. Why do you have to have your body eaten away and broken down and cancer all through you and your heart blow up? Just because that's man's experience, now we think that's how we die. So people say, well, why keep praying for the sick? Because they got to die of something. Look how weird that is in the sense of Jesus paying the price to remove his transgressions. He's bruised for our transgressions. He carried our grief, our sorrow, our pain, our sickness. By his stripes we're healed. He's the redemption of man. He forgave sin and took the effects of sin from us. And now God has to subcontract those same things so we can die? When he came to give us life? When he told us to raise the dead? Come on! I'm not trying to belittle people, I'm trying to belittle the mindset. The thought pattern, trying to smash it so you never embrace it again. What do you mean you have to die of something? That's just opening your life as a stamp and a target for infirmity. You're in position for something to attach to you. We say, yeah, brother, but I'm not getting any younger. You're in the kingdom. What does that mean? Yeah, but I'm 60. What is 60 in the kingdom? What is 60 in Christ? Somebody help me with this, because I hear this language in the body of Christ almost daily. (sighs) Yeah, but I'm not getting any younger. You're eternal. You have everlasting life. Yes, but my body, I understand your body's running its course, but where does it say it has to break down and be filled with disease now that Christ has come? Why can't it carry you to the finish line, fulfill all the will of God, and then rest in Him? Why not? See, we don't understand that we're expecting things as we age. So we don't have the faith to really combat them. We're just driven by the inconvenience of them. So we pray because it sure is miserable to have arthritis everywhere. Sure is miserable to not feel the cartilage that used to be there. And it sure is hard to go up the steps, God help me. But we're expecting that to be our condition because of our age. So there's really no faith and aggression to be healed because it's everybody's scenario. And I'm not being arrogant and proud, but I'm going to be a living epistle on this topic. I promise you I am. People say, you run too much. You're going to blow out your knees running. God made my knees. Where did we get the idea that running wears them out? He told me to run and run hard and fast. Where, where do we get this stuff? Just because it's happened to men through the fall. So we define a fallen man and his anatomy and believe it's our created value. We say, well, the body's this and the body's that. That is not what Adam was before the tree. You're not selling it to me. Come on, I'm 49. I get things in the mail. You are now over 40. You need to have this checked and this checked, and you are more subject to this than ever before. And if you're not careful, you're in fear and you're praying because you're 49. I laugh. I roll that stuff up in a ball, and I say, God, I thank you for the gospel. If it wasn't for the gospel, I'd probably die. 
and I giggle and I lift my hands and worship Jesus and I throw the thing in the garbage and I worship him because I believe. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I, feel, I don't feel like I slept three hours. <laughs> I, I feel pretty pumped. But I'm serious. It's faith. It's not presumption, it's not all this confession because I'm worried and I'm trying to say the right things to get the right things. What about just believing? What about understanding it's all about first Adam, second Adam? The second Adam removed the first Adam. The second Adam got us back before the first Adam made a big mistake. Keep it that simple. Anything else isn't truth. Ah, you get it? Come on, if you don't believe this way, how are you going to ever pray and have faith? You're just going to pray and have need. We are driven 99.9% .9 of the time to pray because we have need. We don't pray because we have faith. We, have, we pray because the Bible gives us the right to because we read what it says. <laughs> Come on, I'm being real straight. Most of the time, that's what happens. We've been well taught, and we got all the scriptures on sheets. We got them on our refrigerator. We got them in books, scriptures on healing. So we're reading and we're quoting them as if it's our right, birthright. And we talk about a birthright inheritance. And we're just trying to seize something to get help rather than believe his love and his will for us. If we'd ever see how amazingly good God is in the sending of his son, faith is an automatic response. He is so for me. Twice I was jogging in 16 years twice two times and it felt like my knee blew out while I was jogging it's funny one time was right after somebody told me you shouldn't run so much you're gonna wear out your knees and I was like okay <laughs> you sometimes you just you just smile and keep walking because they're Christian people and people think you're proud if you're hypo spiritual if you have a different belief so isn't it funny that right after that my knee goes boom while I'm running and you know what I do? I keep on running hard. And it hurt bad. And it was real. Uh -oh. Father, I thank you. You never made my knees to break. I thank you, Father. I'm before the fall of man. God, I thank you for it. And as I'm running, I'm about 10 strides into this pop and pain. And whoop. And now I'm like the Rocky movie. Because <sighs> yeah, I'd have no pain and I'm running harder than before. The second time it happened was on Zarfoss Road and I pulled up lame. It hurt so bad. It just something, it felt like something snapped and I went, whoo, pulled up lame and I, and I was praying and I just put my hands on my knee. Knee, you will not break down. You have no right nor permission. It's not even in your created value. God made you to work and function and serve me all the days of my life. Knee, you will be strong. I looked up and I took off running and the first four or five steps were very seriously challenging. And that's where your head spins. But you just keep taking that step because all of a sudden, and see, we don't teach that stuff because then people will try that and hurt themselves rather than believe that. <laughs> Did you catch that? I don't share. If I'd share my personal testimony, some of them would freak you out. Because I live a certain way because I'm not afraid. It's never about my well-being. It's about knowing him. We are so pampered. We are so in love with ourselves. And some of us are still trying to find ourselves. But we sure covet our flesh. <laughs> wonder if you'd ever let that thing die and get a hold of him. <laughs> See, you can't teach this kind of stuff usually because then people say, well, Dan did it. I'll try it. It worked for him. He's not partial. He'll... And then you're trying something as a method again. And then you say, why didn't this work for me? Or, well, you said you did this. I tried it, and I got hurt. It's not something I tried. It's something I believed. And about the sixth step in, my knee just went, whoop, and was strong as could be. And that's how I live every day of my life. It's amazing. It's just fun. I run about six miles a day, and I run hard. I'm right now at about six and a half minute miles, just cruising, having a ball. But you're 49. Whatever. I don't know what that means in the kingdom. And you can't sell it to me. You just can't. So, wow.
I don't know if I got this story bombarding my mind. I'm trying to fight it off. It's one of them scary stories that you don't teach because people try to do it. But I qualify that now. The story's bombarding me, and I think I'm supposed to share it because of a principle. Help me, Jesus. It's not going away. I'll share it. You all right? We'll share a story. I'm saved three days. My marriage in the natural is a wreck. My wife is sure she hates me. Three days before, I was sure I hated her. Now Jesus came into my heart, and I knew I loved her. That's amazing. (laughs) But I wasn't desperate, and I wasn't trying to get her back. I was enjoying Jesus. A week or two before I got saved, I woke up one morning practically paralyzed in bed. I had so much pain in my body. It was aching in my back and stuff. I didn't know what was going on. My daughter was standing by my bed, 10 years old, saying, Daddy. My wife was away. I said, Daddy? Daddy? And I'm like, I was so in pain and moaning and wincing and rolling around the bed. I didn't know she was there, and I heard her little voice. And It was real early in the morning. It was probably still dark. And I said, yes, honey. She said, are you okay? I said, no. And I had to call my uh, father-in-law and mother-in-law. And I didn't know what was going on. And here I had a kidney stone. Oh, it was bad. Whew. They say it's like the closest pain that a man can experience compared to a woman giving birth. But I had way worse pain than a kidney stone through the witchcraft stuff. Wouldn't trade any of it in for nothing. I'm so glad I went through it all. I know that sounds wild to people, but I wouldn't trade none of that in. It made me like I am. <laughs> See, he came real violent to destroy me. <laughs> I wonder if he didn't. <laughs> wonder, if, wonder, oh my goodness, I'm in trouble. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Are you following me? Because see, we so dread and fear that stuff. We're so trying to pamper and protect ourselves and shield ourselves and use the gospel to live in a bubble that it makes us easy targets. We think it's about having no adversity. It's about knowing him in the face of it because that's how you'll know him more. I wouldn't trade one of those experiences in for nothing. They were way too valuable. Oh, they taught me so much. But here's one right out of the gate. So I go and they check me out. <laughs> I wake up. I'm, my, my poor father-in-law, he drives over and picks me up. He had kidney issues as a young man and he knew what it was like. So he got out of bed and raced to get me. He's helping me. He's laying down his life. It's getting daylight. He's laying down his life. My mother-in-law's watching the kids. They called Kim. She was out of town and told her what happened to me. And she said, she told me she was so happy. She was like, good, I hope he's hurting good. I hope it hurts even more. She said she was so bitter. She was like, ha, ha, ha. She said she ate it up that I was in trouble. And I said, oh, my goodness. And, uh, but I remember my father-in-law's driving to the hospital, and I'm like, I'm like, can't you drive any faster? Don't you know I'm hurting? Come on. And he said, Dan, I'm driving as fast as Just get me there. Would you just get me there? I was that bad, and I wasn't saved. Later, I was like, oh, I felt so bad. I poly-. He said, you don't need to apologize. I would have treated you that way when I had my kidney stuff. It was that bad. So I wake up. I'm in an emergency cubicle. I got catheter thing in. I know this is one of them TMI things, but I, I don't know what's going on. I still don't know what's going on because I'm passing out, and they gave me this pain stuff, and I just kind of crashed. It was pretty serious. And I'm looking at, I got this catheter. I thought, oh, my God, I got a catheter. You know how they go down into the bags? I looked at the bag. It looked like somebody poured a can of tomato juice in there, right? And I'm like, that's coming out of me? I'm thinking I'm dying. I'm thinking my body's been eaten up inside. It's just a kidney stone. It's, but it's big, like really big. <laughs> they had already ultrasounded it, and they came and told me, and they said, look, we're just going to give you this. We're going to set you up with this appointment over at Apple Hill, da-da-da. But they said, this thing is big, like big. <laughs> and I'm thinking, how big can it be? They said, too big to pass. And if it rolls any further... It's going to block your urethra tube or whatever it is going down into your bladder, whatever tube that is. I'm not an anatomy guy, but some of you know. There's a tube coming out of your kidney into your bladder. Right? And then 
out, right? The, the stone, the stone was sitting there at the mouth of that tube. They said it was really big, like way bigger than the mouth of the tube, way bigger. And they said, that's a problem because if it settles there, it'll block all the flow of my kidney and back into my body. So that they were going to have to do a surgery. I don't know why they do stuff where they and break it and stuff. They, nobody even suggested that. I go to the doctor. I'm not saved. The doctor says, we need to make an appointment. And you take it real easy till then. And we're going to make an appointment uh, for you. And I said, well, what are you going to do? Do you break this thing up? He said, no, we can't. And there was a reason. I don't remember. But he said, oh, my goodness. <laughs> Your girls don't understand. He said, we're going to go from the outside in. We're going to take a wire with a claw on it. We're going to go up through your body, grab it real tight, and pull it out. I said, huh? <laughs> Every man in the room feels compassion for me in that moment. <laughs> yeah, look at your eyes, dude. <laughs> it would not be a good day, right? I said, you're going to, I said, you're going to what? I already lost my voice. You're going to what? <laughs> he said, we're going to go up. <laughs> what? <laughs> no. <laughs> so I have this appointment scheduled. In the meantime, I go to work and Jesus saves me. Three days later, I called a pastor in the area. Pastor Jack Cashman. Some of you might know who he, he had passed a little while back. I called Pastor Jack Cashman. Because my aunt went to his church. I told him my experience on Sunday night. And it was Tuesday. I called and told him my experience. And I was looking to get into a church. I hadn't been in a church for eight years. But I was pouring out my heart. And he said, man, you haven't been in church for eight years. He said, you're talking so clear. You must have really got a revelation. I said, sir, my life will never be the same. I'm transformed. Jesus is Lord. Whoa, he's alive. He's like, wow, I'd like to meet you. You had some encounter. He said, can you come in Wednesday morning, tomorrow morning? I said, well, I would like to, but I have a surgery schedule. He said, for what? And I told him, he said, look, God is so radical. Just come in here. We want to surround you and pray. And God can bust up that stone and take it out of your body. He can just take it. And I said, really? Because I didn't know. He said, just come on in. I said, so I was told him my appointment's pretty early. He said, well, we're in pretty early. Come first thing as soon as we get here, and I'll have the staff gather around you. So I ran in there, and I introduced myself, and I'm three days old in the Lord. So I'm in there, hi. <laughs> you know, it's me, born again. <laughs> and they talking to me a little, and they prayed, laid hands on me, started to pray over me, and I felt this chill in my kidney. It was so fun. This chill was in my kidney, and it started to go up my body. This like a chill. It was, it was at a spot. It was like a real cold feeling right at a spot. And it went, ooh, and I felt this boop. And I went, oh, my God, it disappeared. It popped. Ooh, I'm bawling. Oh, my God. <laughs> and, I'm like, and I sit on the couch, and, and they're all laughing. And they're like, oh, God's really on him. And I'm like, oh. And, and I had to get, they said, you better get to your appointment. I said, well, I will, but hey, I'm healed. So I go in there. Hi, I'm Dan, but you're not going to have to do the surgery on me. God just healed, healed me and took the kidney stone. And I'm talking like to them, I am totally toasted. I am like, we're, they're thinking we're going to get the stone and then we're going to look at your brain. Because I'm that convinced. I'm like, hey, uh. Look, I have an appointment. You said, they said they're going to run this dye in me. They're going to take this claw and go up in my body. Yeah, right. God loves me. He took the thing out already. <laughs> so they said, well, sir, we need to process you. We need to take you in the room. And I said, well, you're not going to have to do the surgery. You're not doing the surgery. Do you understand God healed me this morning? Well, what do you mean? Some people prayed, and I felt the cold. It just, boop, and it's gone. The stones, I don't need the surgery. Put the claw away. I, I was, 
I'm so terrified of the claw. You have no idea. I was not a man. I was afraid. I really was. I was petrified. But now that Jesus showed up, I'm thinking, don't need the claw. He healed me. So it wasn't a cop out to try to avoid the surgery. I believed I didn't need the surgery. And I kept telling him, I don't need the surgery. Don't need. Nurse came in. She's got all her instruments. She's got her thing of dye and this big syringe. And she, yeah, that. Yeah, no, they were bringing that on a skidboard. <laughs> and so, anyhow, she comes in. She says, you're Mr. Moeller. Yes, I need to sit you up here. Da, da, da. I said, ma'am, I already explained at the desk. I don't need the surgery. Oh, did you pass the stone? No, God took it. God touched me this morning. They prayed. What are you talking about? Oh, she was so disgusted. She's like, oh, I don't even have time for you. She's like, she was so disgusted with me. I said, honey, there's another nurse that I didn't even notice because this nurse was so, I really noticed her because she was quick to let me know how foolish I was and sit on that thing, we're doing this. And I said, no, absolutely not. I said, you need to take another x-ray. I don't need this surgery. And if my insurance won't pay it, I'll pay it. Take the thing because you're not doing that claw if there ain't no stone. I don't want you to do the claw if there is a stone. She's like so mad at me. She goes, takes the x-ray. She comes back. She says, oh, you should have saw her. Some people really enjoy people's stuff. Because people are hurting out there. She, I mean, she looked to me like sinister, like on them cartoons, some sinister character. She said, well, Mr. Moeller. <laughs> she did. She said, well, Mr. Moeller. We still have a stone. And she was gloating in it. Oh, and I was like, huh? Ma'am, I can't. I, I, I know I don't need the surgery. I felt God touch me. She said, well, I don't know what you felt, but you have a stone and you've wasted enough of our time. So sit on that table because we're getting the dye out. I said, ma'am, I need to see that x-ray. Forgive me, but I know God touched me. And I don't need the surgery. I kept saying I don't need the surgery. I looked at the x-ray. And I had seen the other ones. And I looked at it. She said it's right there. And it was big. It looked like somebody dropped a green pea inside of my kidney. <gasps> and I'm thinking. How were they thinking of pulling that through there? And then there. And then through there. <laughs> I'm looking at this and I said, ma'am, this stone was laying here. Do you have my other x-ray? She's your other x-ray right here. She's ah, like, now you're a doctor, right? And she's flipping on the lights and she points and says, there's your other x-ray. And she points to this stone and I said, but look at this. I said, honey, that's why they're doing the surgery. Look where the stone is. Look where it is in this new picture. It's in the very top little cavity and compartment. I don't know if you know how your kidneys look. They're like little sidewalls and gaps in them. And it was laying up there on the very top rafter. <laughs> I said, honey, it's up there. Well, I don't know how it got up there, and I don't know what it's doing up there. Mr. Muller, you have a stone, and it's too big to pass, and we need to take it out. Sit on the table. I said, call my doctor. He needs to see the x-ray. He's right down the hall. He has to see this x-ray because something happened. Now she's, now I'm the patient, and I'm not being mean, I'm just sure I don't need the surgery, and now I see the stone, now I'm thinking more I don't want the claw, serious, because I was shocked when she told me the stone's still there, my heart sank, but I still had to look, so she sends him down to the doctor, she says, sir, she was really mad, you have no idea how mad she was at me. She said, I don't know if you understand what you're creating today. We have all these patients. We have all these appointments. And here you are. And you have wasted so much of our time. You need to sit on that table and let me begin to prep you. Because you're going to have to have this surgery. Don't you understand? You still have a stone and it's too big to pass. And I'm like, she's starting to make sense to me. Has God really said you're going to die? God just knows. I was listening. I sit down. And hey. I sat down on the mic. I sat down on the table, 
and I'm ready to give up my arm. She's getting this dye out, and she's happy. This is the best part of her day. She's like, this religious kook is getting what's coming to him. And she was right. Because as she's getting this dye in the syringe, the phone rang right on the wall. She picked it up and said, yes. Really? <laughs> okay. Click. It was your doctor. He said, he needs to see you right away. You don't need this surgery. I said, I've been telling you that all morning. I was so flipped out. I was so pumped. I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you. I was like the most amazing Christian. I'm three days saved. Thank you, Lord. Yay. No claw. I was... <laughs> And, and I wanted to hug her, and she would have hit me. She was so mad that I didn't need the surgery. She wanted to stick me with that dye, man. And I get up, and I start heading out the room. I said, see you, honey, and I'm sorry you didn't understand and that we, you know, felt like this, but oh, see ya. I was pumped. I was just like, you know. Uh-oh. Oh, I got to settle down. <laughs> settle down, Dan. You're only on three hours sleep. When you're on three hours sleep, you're supposed to be tired. <laughs> so I'm walking around the corner, and I feel this person apprehend me and grab my sleeve. I look, here's the little nurse, just the little precious thing. Tears filled her eyes. Watch what she said. You don't realize how, even though this lady was mad at me and indignant and frustrated, her little helper was standing there in the corner quiet the whole time listening and watching. I didn't even think about her being there because this other lady. You know what I'm saying? I think that might be, is that connection or a battery do you think? You think, does it click off and on like that, Josh, because of a battery or a connection? Okay, because I'm jumping around. I've just turned it. I think I got it. <laughs> now watch what she does. She's got tears in her eyes. And I said, oh, hi. She said, oh, my goodness. She said, you are just such a Christian. She said, I so need to grow. You are so grown and mature in the Lord. You must have been a Christian for a long time to walk in the kind of faith that I see in you and just your boldness to declare him. I watched God move in there and, and I just can't wait. I need to grow and mature like I see you. And, and I, she said, I'm a Christian too. And I said, honey, I've been saved three days. <laughs> she thinks I'm a seasoned Christian, mature, walking in God, carrying myself in God. <laughs> I'm three days saved. All I know is my kidney had a chill and I'm afraid of the claw. That's all I know. I had a chill and fear and it came together and she thought it was amazing. <laughs> she's a fervent mom. She's like so convicted by my life. I'm three days saved. She said, but the way you spoke up and took a stand. I said, honey, I'm saved three days. She said, what? I said, Sunday night. Yay. I said, but I'm glad I'm in the family. Love you. I hugged her. Took off. Sitting in the room. Dr. Sedan, I've been a specialist in this field my, my whole, you know, medical profession for however much time. I don't remember details. He said, I've never seen anything like this. I said, what do you mean? He said, a kidney stone can't go up. All the flow's down. And your body's up and down and all the flow's from the top down. A kidney stone can't do what your kidney stone did. It doesn't make any sense to me. There's no explanation. I said, there is, sir. Some people this morning surrounded me and prayed. I had a revelation Sunday night in the Lord. God changed my life, doctor. He's real and he lives inside of me and loves me. I called a pastor. I told him I had this appointment. He wanted to meet with me. He said, well, let's just pray for you. God is so radical. He could take the stone out of you. I said, I don't understand why he didn't take it out. But he obviously took it from needing that claw. He took it and put it up in the top. And he said, and you canceled the surgery because I sure didn't, wasn't looking forward to that. He said, well, this is amazing because this, it can't do that. I said, well, then it is God, isn't it? And he's just like, hmm. And I said, so what do we do? He said, well, there is one thing. You still have a stone. And he said, if that thing rolls off of that shelf and falls down to where it was, you're going to be back in the hospital with a catheter and passed out and... It's going to be an ugly scene. 
But he said, where it's at right now, we really can't go get it. He said, we'd have to wait for it to move. So I'm not sure how this happened. I said, sir, it was God. It's going to have to work out. It's God. I actually had the instinct and understanding to know that God didn't put it up there to roll it back out. I actually understood that. And that was three days saved, guys. By sheer instinct, I understood God didn't move it up there to roll it back down and sit up with heaven and go, ha, ha, look at him roll. Look at him scream. (laughs) Oh, dude, look at a catheter bag. Yeah, let's stick it back up and do it tomorrow. (sighs) Here's what he said. He got that sinister look like the nurse had. He wasn't being mean. He was being real. He pulled out these serious painkillers. And he said, well, I'm going to give you these. It's just a few samples. They're very, very strong. Don't take them. Just keep them with you everywhere you go. And he looked at me. He really leaned in, Matt. He said, if that stone moves this much, you will need these. And I went... And I backed up. <laughs> and he's like, and uh, I said, is there anything that, you know, wh- so what do I do? He said, well, I, well, it's just a waiting process, but I wouldn't encourage you. I don't know if you're athletic. I don't know. I said, I run all the time. I'm a jogger. And he said, uh, I would encourage you not to run. Because he said, running is just boom, boom, boom. And he said, you're just going to roll that thing right off the shelf. <laughs> So I went in and saw Pastor Jack and I told him about my experience. And he said, wow. He said, so that was definitely God. He said, it's stuff that creates questions and people don't know why God does stuff like that. But obviously that was God. I said, I guarantee that was God. I didn't get no claw today. (laughs) And he said, I said, uh, I said, you know, I don't believe God did this for it to just roll back down. He said, that's awesome. Just believe that. You believe And you speak to God what you believe he's doing right now. And that'll be your faith. And that's what he told me. So I went home. I'm all by myself. And here's what I said. It's amazing. Three days saved, guys. I said, Lord, you did an amazing thing today. You spared me of that surgery. You moved that stone. I felt it myself. That was amazing. I thought it was disappeared. But it's still there. But you moved. God, I'm believing you're going to take this out of my body. If you can move it around like that, you can take it out of me. And I'm believing right now that you love me so much, you're going to take it out of me. No pain, no blood, no nothing. Right? Thank you, Father. Went to work, jogged every day. Every day I jogged. Seven weeks later, my family... And me are heading to Montana. I got the whole car packed. My family's restored. My wife had that amazing experience in the bathroom. And our marriage got healed. My kids just meshed right into the change in my life. So it's like a dream come true. It's like a fairy tale. In fact, we drove 2,200 miles with a 10 and 5 year old. And not one time did they say, are we there yet? Wow. (laughs) There wasn't one scuffle or fight in the back seat. They played and talked and laughed the whole time time we played worship music and wept the whole way to Montana because God redeemed our lives my kids not one time was there even a a moment of contention stress or stop it or give me that or are we there yet that is impossible there was a 48 hour period when my wife and I got restored that we don't remember we don't remember feeding our kids putting them to bed or nothing for 48 hours Don't know. It's amazing. Heaven's real. (laughs) So I packed the car. We prayed in a circle. And uh, we went outside. It was funny. People, you know, teach you stuff. Seven weeks, you've been around the church long enough. So they got us building barriers around the car. So I got the kids on each side and me and my wife. And we're praying around the car. I'm not saying it's wrong. We're just doing this. And as a man, I thought, okay, I packed them all in. I thought, I better run in. And just now, seven weeks, I'm living like a man without a stone. Running every day, not even thinking about the stone. 
Thank you, Jesus. Faith before the Lord. Grace on my life. Faith, grace. Right? I go in the house. I'm looking around the room, making sure we didn't forget nothing because you're going 2,200 miles. You can't get to Minnesota and say, oh, we forgot this. So I'm looking, scanning, looking, scanning. I looked on the hutch, and there's that little capsule of pills. And in my mind, just out of rationale, I went, wow, 19 days, 2,200 miles. I guess it wouldn't hurt to grab these because if something would happen, it'd be a mess to be the whole way out there have the kids be on the road or something. So I didn't say nothing to nobody. I just stuck them in my pocket. When I got to the car, I laid them in the, the little handle of the door, the little pouch thing on the door. It seemed innocent to me. But guess what I was doing? Well, I wasn't purposely doubting. Here's what I was doing. I was living as a man without a stone and walking in the grace of it. And now I'm saying, what if? And picking it back up the identity of a man with a stone. Now watch. Watch how peculiar this is. I get to the first rest stop. We actually made it to Pittsburgh on the turnpike with my kids before they said we'd got to go to the bathroom. That's amazing. It's four hours, three and a half hours. With kids. I can't, I, if I was traveling with Todd, I'd have stopped three times. <laughs> I told Todd, you're not like traveling with kids. You're like traveling with a youth group. <laughs> Just you is like a whole youth group. <laughs> 40 minutes down the road. Dude, do you like ever have to go? Nope. <laughs> like never? Nope. <laughs> Could we like stop? We stopped twice already in the last hour and a half. Dude. <laughs> Took me a long time to discipline his bladder. But we did it. <laughs> we did it. Man. <laughs> We just flew from Denver to BWI. It's three hours. We got off the plane. He said, you proud of me? I didn't get out of my seat the whole time. He said, you did a good thing back in those days. Get to the Pittsburgh rest stop. I run into the bathroom. I'm at the urinal, the men's room. Feel fine. Go in the bathroom and you know, I know this is TMI stuff, but... You just make sure everything's right, and you just look down, and you just make sure everything's right. Like, you don't, you don't want to miss the urinal. It's just instinct. You just, Patty, it's normal. We, come on, honey, pull it together. We pee every day. Come on, come on, pull it together, girl. <laughs> now watch. I looked at, because this story gets worse. I got to prepare you. I looked down, and I went, oh, my gosh. The stream coming out of my body was full of blood. Now, isn't it amazing? I'm running every day. I'm jogging every day. Totally normal. I pick up those pills and say, what if? It'd be a good idea. It'd be wisdom, brother. You better use... Wi that phrase has stopped the power of God more times than you can imagine. Because who's wisdom? What are we talking about? Our own concerns and inconsistencies. So I pick up these pills, and I'm not telling you to ever do what I did. I'm just sharing a principle of how faith works and really seeing and really believing how powerful it is because I'm telling you to not do what I did. You have to have a revelation. So I'm standing there, and watch this. Now, this might be too intense. You might not hear this right, but in my tender seven-week stage, as I see that blood rolling down into that urinal, I realized immediately there was a connection with those pills. Now watch, I felt like I committed adultery. I felt like I just watched a bad movie. I felt like I'd sinned so bad. I, I felt like I sinned. I'm standing there, at the, and I'm not, I'm not saying that's the reality of it. That's how I personally felt at the time. I just started bawling at the urinal. And I said, God, oh my God, God, forgive me. Oh my God, why did I, I didn't. So I come out of the men's room crying. My wife's like, honey, what's wrong? Because she's just, I'm just wired and happy. And now I come out of the men's room. <laughs> I, mean, I come out of the men's room crying. And I said, I just sinned. She said, what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I, I picture that. I'm all broken. I'm like a little kid. I'm coming across the parking lot. 
<laughs> and she says, honey, what's wrong? She's all sweet. Honey, what's wrong? I just sinned. What, what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> Help us, Jesus. We can get through this class. I said, watch what I said. I reached down in the door and I said, I brought these along. She said, So? Really? She said, So? She said, you don't understand. Now I'm seven weeks old in the Lord. Nobody's teaching me this stuff. I'm just learning as I go. I said, Seven weeks ago. God, and I explained it. I said, and then this is, Kimmy, this is a what if. This is a taking back the problem. It's a what if to me. I was already settled. Now watch. If you're not settled and you're concerned, is it wrong to take them pills along with you? I would never tell anybody not to if you're concerned. I tell people if you're afraid and, and you got trouble and you're afraid and you're trying to find faith, Man, just go to 911 and keep pursuing faith on the way. I don't make it difficult, but I do go after faith. See what I mean? We find faith in His love. We find revelation through the gospel. Then when the crisis rises, the revelation responds. If we're trying to apply faith and find faith in the middle of the crisis, we're probably a step behind. Probably need to just get some help, walk our way through in Christ, unless it's your own personal well-being at life and you make this decision to stand. But you never do that at the cost of another person. That's why tragedies have happened and faith has a bad impression. Because people have, in pride and, and trying to make a statement, have resisted things for kids and people and stuff and for wrong reasons and bad things happen. Follow me? So I said, she said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know where this scripture is. I've been reading so much of my Bible. But I know it says in the Bible, if I confess my faults one to another and pray for one another that we might be healed. If I just confessed my fault to you, please pray for me. Well, my wife, the prayer was pitiful because she loved me. She was so, it was like so works oriented. She's so like, she's feeling like I didn't sin at all, right? I'm feeling like I just committed adultery or something, you know? I'm like, Whoa. and she's like, Lord, oh, she was so precious. Lord, you have changed Dan so much. He's a brand new man. He's such a blessing. He's such a good guy. He's just so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just sitting there. And she prayed for me because it was her heart towards me. I'm not making fun of her. It was just funny how we think. It's not works. It's not married. You're not healed because you're a good guy. You're healed because Jesus is Lord and God loves you and paid the price. <laughs> so I get up out of the car and I started across the lot. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'll be back. I took that pills and I went over to the rest can and the waste can and I threw them down in the bottom of the waste can. While I'm passing blood in my urine, I throw them in there. Now, see, you don't do that as a faith tactic. You do that because you see what's happening and you cancel the problem and get back in the place you were. Period. That's what I did. Now, you better know that's what you believe in every revelation. If you try to do what I did, well, Dan threw his pills away. I just need to throw my pills away because as long as I'm throwing, taking my pills, it's, and I hear people say that, it's condemnation. As long as I'm taking my pills, I'm just da, 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 da. And the only reason they're thinking should they throw their pills away because they're being condemned that they're taking them, not because they have a revelation. Hello? So I don't tell you to stop that stuff. I say keep pursuing Jesus till you get a revelation. And when you know you're in that place. See, because when I drop those pills and I'm passing blood, what happens if I get 10 down, miles down the road and an ache starts pursuing my kidney? What happens if I'm 50 miles down the road and it really starts hurting? I can't second guess. I can't say, oh God, why did I throw them pills away? You turn, let's go dig in that can. No, you just believe. Story's beautiful. I... uh Went to Montana for 19 days. Ran every day out there that I could. Came back. Was home about a week or so. Jogging every day. Life is good. God is good. Family's restored. Yay for Jesus. 
I go up one day not even thinking. I mean, how much time is going by? Over a month, around a month. I go to the bathroom. You women are funny. You'll know, you, 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 especially you moms and older women that have been around us guys a lot. You're always saying, don't pee on the seat. If you pee on the seat, make sure you wipe it. Oh, that's gross. Why did you? You're missing. You know. <laughs> This guys can tend to do that a little bit. So I'm real conscious. Every time I go to the bathroom, I grab clear. I wipe the whole thing around. My wife's like loves me for that. She says, you really do good. I said, you taught me. But on this day, I blew it bad. Because I go to the bathroom. I lift the seat like a good guy. See, you ladies got to sit on that thing. So I lift that seat up. Now I'm going to the bathroom. You know how you got them spray nozzles on a hose? And do the garden? I'm standing there, and my stream of urine goes, <laughs> I go, oh, all over. You have no idea. It, it, it didn't even make sense. It was like, it was all over the back of the toilet. It was on the side of the wall running. It, and my heart's jumping out of my chest. I'm like, what happened? Because all of a sudden, it was back to normal. It just went, and back to normal. Well, it, it had to happen that way. It didn't have to supernaturally, but it had to happen that way or I missed what happened. All of a sudden, it hit me. That stone. When that stone popped out of my body, it obstructed the flow and sprayed everywhere. Oh, I was so pumped. I could clean that up. But if that wouldn't have happened, I wouldn't have known I looked in the toilet because it, it just, and it probably was God the stone. I looked in the toilet. It was down in there. Whoa, yeah! Whoa! Yeah! I was so pumped. Not a drop of blood, not one pain. It wasn't broke, chipped. That thing was like a green pea. I looked at that. I looked at me. Impossible! Oh, tears running down my face. I go run. We're under the chandelier. I said, guys, look at the miracle of God. That's the kidney stone. And the kids are like, whoa. Did you ever look at one? Magnified? It looks like the ends of sharp knife blades cut off and all glued together. Is that my telling the truth? This thing was so nasty. It looked like a million razors intertwined and stuck together in a ball. And they roll through your body and cut you to pieces. <laughs> yeah, one kidney stone, like an atonement, you know, a sacrifice. <laughs> not one pain, not one drop of blood, absolutely, totally physically, humanly, impossible. If that thing would have moved that much, the doctor said, you will need these. <laughs> Guess where they were? Somewhere in a waste dump. Mm -hmm. Guess where Jesus was? At the right hand of Almighty God, making intercession for me. Guess where I was? In faith and trusting Him in the midst of a real situation. <sighs> You got to tell some of these stories so you understand what's wrong with me. <laughs> Serious. Come on. I'm seven, eight weeks old. Uh, eight, seven weeks old in the Lord when that happened. 19 days plus a week later. I'm 11, I'm, I'm 11, 12 weeks old in the Lord. What do you think that does to me when I'm holding that stone? Oh, I was weeping. I stood there and my family's looking and, and my kids are watching me cry. And I said, look at this, Kim. I had to put the, micro, or the magnifying glass on it and they're like, whoa. And I said, that was in my kidney, kids. I prayed and I explained all the story. It came the whole way out of my body and never felt a thing. Isn't that fun? I grabbed them pills and passed blood the very next time I went to the bathroom. Threw them things away. Never had another symptom, passed the thing just like I had believed. Why did it take all that time, brother? What's it matter? But that's a question. Well, why did, why did it take all that time? Oh. Y'all follow me? 
Oh, it's fun. Sorry, I know that story was long. Oh. If you don't understand the will of God, you can't have faith like that because you're wondering what's going on still. You're still trying to zero in on truth. I wonder if you understand the will of God. Ephesians 5.17 says, do not, 5.17, Ephesians 5.17 says, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Romans 12.2 says, do not, do not be conformed to the way of the world, its ideas, its mindsets, its rationale. But be transformed. You know he's talking about ideas and mindsets because he's talking about renewing your mind. He says, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? Why do you need your mind renewed? So who can prove? So you can prove the good, acceptable, perfect will of God. That is not three different aspects of God's will. God's will is good. It's acceptable. It's perfect. It's not three different positions of will. Like permissive, submissive. We get all technical on stuff. Are you kidding me? Just walk in the will of God. Just stay in obedience. <laughs> good, acceptable, perfect. It's just progressive. It's just saying his will is always good. Peace on earth. Good will toward man. If God's will is good, it's surely acceptable. And if it's acceptable and God is perfect, his will is surely perfect towards us. Amen? But we're supposed to prove it. Prove, know that we know that we know. Who knows what I mean by that phrase? To know that you know that you know that you know. Every question answered through Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Who knows that when I go over to the garbage can, that is not a faith strategy. It's because I know that I know that I know that I know. <laughs> Understanding the will of God. I know we got on this healing thing yesterday. Understanding the will of God is huge. It's very important. Uh, it's important to believe that Jesus came for a purpose, paid a price for a purpose. He, didn't, he came to remove sin and the effects of sin. If sickness and disease came through the fall of man and Jesus took the fall so we could get back up, why would we think God uses these very same things to teach us, to build character and all this kind of stuff? I, 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 I couldn't disagree more in my own heart. I don't want to argue about it with people. I, I, I want to be so sure in my mind so that I can have faith and believe the heart and nature of God in a situation. If I believe for one minute that God subtracts out the devil, subcontracts him, or, or uses the things he paid to remove, then I'm in limbo. I don't know whether I'm coming or going when I'm in a situation because is it God uh, or is it the devil? Jesus said the thief comes but to comes not but to steal, kill, and destroy. So, but I have come. So it's a, it's a contrast. The thief comes for this reason, to steal, kill, destroy. And if you look in John 10.10, 10, when he's talking about the thief, we all know, we all think devil when he says thief, but it's actually false teaching is what he's talking about in John 10.10. 10. And the reason we know it's the devil because every false teaching comes from the devil. But he's really addressing false teachers, false teaching. And the purpose of false teaching is to steal, kill, and destroy. So where does it come from? It comes from the enemy, of course. So why? Because he wants to steal, kill, and destroy the finished work of Christ, the purpose of the covenant, the joy that's in your heart, the hope of salvation, and whatever else good thing comes through the cross. But false teaching is detrimental. It steals, kills, and destroys. It tells you why you should be careful to have a hope when the Bible says hope's the anchor of your soul and faith is the substance of your things hoped for. When you don't understand who God is, when you don't know the will of God, you can't have faith. You can't set your confidence in a thing because you're not sure where God stands. So you're reduced to praying a cross fingers prayer in a method, you're saying the right things, hoping it works. I had a pastor really upset with me one time, really, really mad at me. And I mean, he was so mad at me in a parking lot, and he just, bam, 
Found out later his mother died of cancer. That's why he was so mad at what I was preaching. Because he took it so personal and he took it so inward. And that if, if what I was preaching, then he was hearing it as uh, suggesting that his mom didn't have faith or was in sin. I wonder if we just don't have understanding. I wonder if we're super good people and don't have understanding and we're destroyed for the lack of knowledge. I wonder if it's that simple. I wonder if our, our knowledge, what we're calling knowledge, is actually destroying us. I wonder if we're making exception for faith and giving permission for things that could be changed because of our theology. See, here's the paradox. I got an open vision in my kitchen one time of the hand of God coming down rescuing two babies in the NICU unit. The hand, an open vision. I'm bawling on the phone. It's a long story. I won't tell it. But the, the hand came down and scooped the babies. And when the, the hand scooped, the babies were in the palm of the hand. If my theology was that God takes people and doesn't heal everybody, and sometimes he ordains death, I would have said, take heart, Mom. You need to find peace because your babies are in the hand of God, as if the hand now is going to go back up into heaven. And that's how I would have interpreted and prophesied the vision. But I don't have a grid for that. That's the last thing I could possibly think when I see the hand scoop the babies. So guess what I said? Mom, you better take heart. Your babies aren't dying. They're in the hand of God. Your babies are going to live. Well, the one baby had to die because the lungs weren't formed. It was one pound, nine ounces. And the lungs weren't formed and they were going to unhook the respirator. The baby had to die. But they're in the hand of God. Yeah, but brother, he's taking them to be with the Lord. No, they're in the strong hand of God. They're going to live. Prophetic. <sighs> My theology determines how I understand the vision. True? And if I don't have the theology that I have, then I'm thinking what? God's letting me know he's taking the baby. <sighs> but I proclaimed the lip. Guess what happened? They unhooked the little baby from the respirator. And they're sad, and the nurses are sad because they watch tiny babies in NICU die all the time. And it's precious little life. When I saw the babies, I stood there and just cried and cried. I never saw a one pound, nine ounce baby in my life. And I just looked in there, and I couldn't believe it. About like that, laying there. Took this wedding band up the hand to the armpit like this and never touched nothing of the baby. The nurse wanted me to have a visual of how little they were. So she, she took my wedding band, she cleaned it, sanitized it up. She said, I just want to show you so you can always remember. Took her little hand, put it through up to the armpit and went wow. like this with this wedding band right here. I stood there and cried. But they unhooked the respirator, the ventilator thing, and she just curled up, sucked her little hand, and curled up in a little ball. And they're waiting for her to terminate. She never did. And after time got so ridiculous that they thought, what is going on? Because she doesn't have the capacity to breathe. She should be gone. They knew something was up. They re ultrasounded her lungs were totally fine. <laughs> but think about the paradox. The hand, whoosh, and how I interpret the vision. The earth he did give to the children of men. You decree a thing and it shall come to pass. Power and life and death is in your tongue. Hello? We're putting it all on God. And God's given us the kingdom. And we're putting it all on God as the sovereign, divine, orchestrating being that he is. He is divine and amazing, and he's incredible, and you can't even put God into words. So am I doing him injustice and dishonor when I talk like this? No, we don't understand. He made us in his image and gave us the kingdom to subdue the earth. He gave us the stewardship of the earth and told us to subdue, and in being subdued, we find fault with God and wonder where he's at and what he's doing. 
And we've turned him into a charade instead of a mystery revealed. Let's read. Now faith is the substance. The substance. Do you know what substance means? It means the realization, the tangibility. Good, that's good. The realization, the tangibility. Whoa. How can I have a realization of my hope without knowing God's nature and His will in the situation? How can I have the realization, the tangibility of hope? Who knows when you're sick, you hope to be healed? Who knows when somebody's dying, you hope they live? Right? But how can I have the tangibility, the realization of that hope if I don't understand the will of God in the matter? How can I be so convinced in my heart and know that I know that I know if I haven't settled God's will? Are you following me? Come on, this is important. This pastor got so mad at me. He said, you're a heretic. You will be judged before God and thrown into hell. He said, it's people like you that are hurting the body of Christ. He's screaming at me. And I said, man, I'm sorry you feel that way. I, I just, I don't, I don't feel that way. Who sees he's mad? Who sees he's hurt because he lost his mother? Who sees that you can say anything in pain? Who knows that I'm not threatened by his threat? Who knows that I'm sitting in my bedroom on my bed and the presence of God comes and he talks to me and fathers me and loves me? And who knows that I know I'm not going to be judged? And who knows I know I'm not a heretic? Who knows he's angry? You follow me? And he said, well, I need to ask you this question. Is it God's will to heal everybody? And I said, of course. Certainly. And that's when he... I met him several years later jogging on a trail. He passed by me. And I recognized him. And I said, hey, pastor. And I said his name. He kept running. And we met coming around the other way on the trail. And he stopped me. And he forgot my name and thought it was Mark. And I said, no, and I told him my name. He said, wow, well, listen, man, it's good I bumped into you because I wanted to say, you know, there was a time I really treated you rough and blah, 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 and I'm sorry. It wasn't a God thing. Did the whole religious thing. People carry hurts for years. It's amazing. We got talking a little, and he asked me how I'm doing and what's happening, what's going on, and I began to share with him. He said, see, you're going in that same line. He said, let me ask you a question. Do you still believe it's God's will? And I said, emphatically, absolutely, yes. And he just turned red again. And he said, that's what I hate about you Pentecostal charismatics. And I cried on the trail in the woods when you weren't there. And I said, is that what I am? I don't even know that's what I am. Just in love with Jesus, sir. I just seek him. I said, you don't know my tears. You don't see my prayer life. You're not with me when I'm with him. He says, you're projecting on me. It's easy to be mad. And you're just mad. And I said, you just told me to forgive me and da-da-da. It's really not the case. And no, you're right. And then he went on again to tell me I'm going to be judged and be a heretic. And I'm a heretic. And really went on and on. And I thought, wow. I'm learning from this, but I'm really broken in my heart. People take life really personal. And when you take life so personal, it keeps you from having an ear to hear what the Spirit of the Lord's saying through the Bible. Because what he's saying, you're interpreting through your pain, not his life. You follow me? And now he's pastoring, carrying that kind of pain, projecting that belief on multitudes of people accusing me of being a heretic when all the while he's in pain I have the joy of my salvation and I've watched countless people truly healed and then the bottom line was I'll tell you how irrational people get he said well you've been just talking about yourself the whole time he asked me how I was doing and what's new <laughs> he said you haven't even asked me how I'm doing and he just started nitpicking like that and I thought wow hurt is a wretched terrible treacherous thing and, and I said, well, listen to this. And I shared something, and, he's, and he called me a liar. 
You're nothing but a liar. And then he, as I told him, I run on the trail all the time. Well, I never saw you on the trail before. See, you're a liar. That's how hurt he is. I looked at him and I was crying pretty hard by this point. And I said, my God, you're pastoring people. Your heart's in trouble. And you're pastoring people. And I was just standing there crying. I said, oh, my God. Sir, you're pastoring with that kind of heart. And I was crying. And I said, I'm going to go now. And I started jogging down the trail. And he said, hey. He said, look, man, we, we can't leave like this. Look, I forgive you. I'm sorry. And I stopped and I said, no, you're not. And no, you don't. You're being religious. Yeah, you're right. I hate you. You're a heretic. <laughs> and he turned and ran away. And I thought, boy, hurt is a terrible thing. When you suffer physical loss and anybody's saying anything other than what's trying to protect your hurting soul, you're a cat in a corner. And you will kill that thing. You see what I'm saying? I cried the whole way home. Not because I was hurt. I promise you guys, <laughs> you have, it'll be a cold day in hell. <laughs> Before you find me hurt. It just will. I, I just, I see some things there. I was hurting at the reality of what this kind of pain does to us. And then it multiplies itself on a whole lot of other people that are carrying the same pain. So that's how we end up in circles and rivers and camps and streams. Because we find like situations, like people, like beliefs, and we gravitate toward one another. And we come up with belief systems that try to heal our wounds, but there's no real healing. And there's sure no increase of power, so we're always going to have the same scenarios and results. And watch the paradox. The more the results keep the same, the more it affirms your belief. And your belief is causing the results, but the results are affirming the belief. Are you following me? So now it's not just happened once, twice, three times. Now it's happened ten. See, I told you so. The reason I told this story mainly is because of this. I asked him, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. I said, don't you ever have altar calls and ever pray for the sick? Of course we do. The Bible says pray for the sick and anoint them with oil. I said, that's not all the Bible says. I said, let me ask you this. Who's getting healed? That's irrelevant. What matters is, is that we obey and anoint them with oil. I said, it's not the anointing of oil. It's the prayer of faith that saves the sick. Anoint them with oil, praying the prayer of, and the prayer of faith will save the sick and God will raise them up. That's exactly how it quotes. It's James 5, 13, 14. 5.14. Is any among you sick? Let him ask for prayer, having the elders pray over them, anointing them with oil, praying the prayer of faith, and the prayer of faith will, will, the prayer of faith, you want to look at it? James 5, you just want to see it with your eyes? So you see, I'm not preaching my own stuff. <coughs> Is any, see, here's the worst you can get. Persecuted for believing the Bible in the face of people's reality. That's the worst you can get as a Christian. Bring it on. They put Jesus on the cross. We're not trying to pick a fight, but we will not compromise. This is the word of God. Now look, if it's not my reality, I have to grow into it. True? If Jesus said, follow me, and my experience isn't equivalent to his, I'm still growing, right? But if I embrace a belief system contrary to what he taught me, then I'm stopping growing. I've got a ceiling over my head. You follow me? This is important. Is anyone who? Is who? Anyone. anyone. Come on, this is important. Is who? Anyone. 
So there's no exclusions concerning sovereignty or the will of God. Ha! <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Is who? Anyone. Anyone. Come on, you better catch that. If it wasn't like that, God loves us too much to play charades. It would be so technical and complex, it would be ridiculous. It would have to say, is there anyone who's not ordained by God to be sick? Let him ask for prayer, because it's the devil. Well, how do you know if it's the devil or I'm ordained to be sick? Well, I guess pray and find out. If you get healed, it's God's will, then it was the devil. If you don't, it's God's ordination. Well, then when you pray, there's no faith. You follow me? People say, let's pray to see if it's the will of God. If he heals you, it is. If he doesn't, it isn't. But when you pray, it's the big if. So is there ever faith? So do you ever have the realization of your hope or the evidence of things unseen? No. <laughs> There's churches today by the score that say, let's pray and see if it's God's will to heal you. And they pray and say, if it be your will. We're supposed to know the will of God. When you pray, if it be your will, you're making a public testimony and confession. You don't have a clue what God's doing and wants to do. And we're supposed to know. Don't be unwise. Understand the will of God. Prove the perfect will of God. Some of us grew up in circles that threw the will of God around like a hot potato. Like no one could know it. That it was an unholy, irreverent, presumptuous thing to even assume the will of God. To know the will of God. That, that, was, that was blasphemy. Who's grew up in that kind of background? That the will of God was always a mystery. The mystery's revealed. Paul says in Galatians, the mystery's revealed. Christ has come out like God is. He called light to shine in the darkness. Come on. Ah. So I asked this man... Who's getting healed? He said, that's irre irrelevant. And he got really threatened and mad at my question. I said, no, it's not irrelevant because the Bible says the prayer of faith will save the sick. And I said, okay, okay, let me ask you this. Now, now, now hear my heart because I'm trying to reason with him. I'm not slighting him. I'm not bashing him. I said, so what I'm getting from you is people are not getting healed. You're not seeing people healed at the altar. You're going through the motions of ordinance. But sir, I'm telling you of all the people healed. You're calling me a liar. But if I'm not lying, then a lot of people are getting healed. So here's what you're telling me. God's sending the people to your order that it's not the will of God to heal. And he's sending people to our order that it is the will of God to heal. Or is the difference the prayer of faith? You don't know what you're doing. You're just following an ordinance in the sense of God's will. You think it's humble to say, if it be your will... I believe Jesus told me I'd know his will and in the authority of his name pray and move mountain. So what's the difference between nobody getting healed and people getting healed? It's not that everybody's jumping healed, but a whole lot of people getting healed. What's the difference? It's the prayer of faith. I know this. People that embrace what I'm preaching, boy, it's going to be straight, strong comment. People that embrace what I'm preaching see a whole lot more of the miraculous and healings than anybody I know that doesn't preach what I'm preaching. Amen. And you have to make the connection. The connection is what we're willing to believe. You follow me? People that pray, if it be thy will, rarely see anything ever. There's people that have been a Christian their whole life and have never seen a healing or a miracle. And then that begins to be their doctrine, that experience.